GM GM, and welcome to another episode GM. of the Soul Fate Podcast, where we interview founders and builders in the Solana ecosystem. I think this was a good episode, but honestly, was it, I wasn't there, so you'll have to take <laughs> Nick's word for it, not mine. Nick, how was it? Who did we mean, talk to? And by we, I, I thought mean it you. was a pretty good episode. I, I thought it was a good episode. No, I, I had a, it was a solo episode, me and the guests, and it was Vito from All Art. Um, All Art is, is pretty interesting. They're actually, fun fact, when I first discovered All Art and like one of their actual software products, they have like a, a, a Unity, I think it's like a .NET SDK. It was some of the first Solana related code I had ever seen. It was from this team. So fun fact there. And .NET. Um, That's... It was, yeah, it was .NET. Because I was, I was like, oh, maybe I'll build a game on chain and stuff. I'm not a game developer. I don't know anything about building games, but I was like, ah, oh, maybe I'll, I don't know. I was like, oh, Solana, what's this? I didn't this? even know there so, was a C-sharp Solana anything. Yeah. <laughs> Fun fact. Uh, I digress. That's dope. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a really cool conversation with Vito. I actually ran into him at Paris Blockchain Week a couple of weeks ago. We're walking by on the street and we're just like, oh, hey man, what's up? So that was fun. And, it's the most uh, random thing in the world. It, it really was. Uh, but we talked about all art and like their genesis and like how they came to Solana and like what they do. They're, uh, they're an art marketplace, pretty standard. But then we talked about some very unique things that All Art and their company is doing and they plan to do. Teaser. The first thing is Coca-Cola. Global brand. You know, everybody knows who Coca-Cola is. All Art actually has a partnership with Coca-Cola where they've built this platform that Coca-Cola is actually using to put their employee educational certificates on chain on Solana. Ooh. That's pretty fucking cool. Uh, so there's That's that. That was one of the things we talked about, how the relationship came about and and what it looks like and like what they're doing with it. And then the other thing we we kind of teased, we talk about is the All Art team is working on this really big new initiative and, and v- Vito kind of like beats around the bush a little bit throughout the episode. And like, there's a bunch of hints that he's dropping. So a little bit of alpha if you if you jump, pay attention to the details. The alpha. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Nice. He was teasing. He was he, he was teasing me, and I'm still like, what is it? And like, you could piece together some of the pieces, but it's I'm still not quite sure. But okay, okay. And check I'm out to, check out the all art uh, like, socials. It's like, and a, it's like a Taylor Swift album, you know, or is I it's supposedly I, has stuff hidden inside. I don't know what that's it. supposed to mean, James. That's, you don't know. Are you that, a Swiftie? That everyone's no, I'm not. But everyone, I don't know. You look like a Swiftie. How they're they've got like hidden <laughs> messages or something. I don't know. I don't get right? it, but people rave about it. So, and that's what it sounds like you're talking about. Anyway, now that we've talked about all sorts of random things that are relevant, like Taylor Swift, uh, let's jump into the episode. But first, quick, you know, shout out to to partners. Uh, Phantom is the preferred wallet of the Sulfate ecosystem, and we love Phantom. Um, we're building oh, out yeah. some cool like extensions that we think you can use within the Phantom wallet. Uh, we're excited to get those launched here soon. Uh, also, shout out to Unboxed. TM. Unboxed is a dev shop. I, full disclosure, I own and operate Unboxed, um, but we are here for all your, you know, Solana development needs and any other software development needs. Where you know anything web or mobile based, we're we're pretty good at that stuff. So anyway, give me a shout out if you need anything. Uh, otherwise, please follow, subscribe, you know, leave a review for the podcast yes. and whatever you're listening please, to this on. Please add a review in whatever yeah, your like podcast we, you app know, of choice we're, is. We're, we're, uh, we're figuring out the whole marketing thing and getting the word out there a little bit more, but uh, we would love your help in spreading awareness of the show if you're a listener of the show. Anyway, thanks a bunch. Let's, let's jump in. Let's do it. Nothing in this podcast is or should be considered financial advice. Any opinions and thoughts expressed are solely those of the individual. They do not represent the opinions of any entity. Enjoy. Well, Vito, it's it's great to see you again, and uh, you've got your sweet all art shirt. That's also actually a really cool shirt. Um, pretty jealous of it. I just have a plain black hoodie on today, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it's great one. to have. Oh, I've, I won't say no. Uh, it's great <laughs> to have you on the show, though. And uh, one of the things I want to start with is: can you tell the audience about yourself and all art? Give a little bit of background on how you got into crypto, and we'll go from there. Well, we don't have that much time, but <laughs> let's start. So my name is uh, Vito Medevremovic, but you can call me Vito. It's shorter, easier to remember. Um, so I started in crypto in um, 2017, um, especially when Ethereum came out. That was kind of my trigger point, my, my you know, like entry to the 
rabbit hole. And um, immediately at that time, uh, we were starting to develop our platform for virtual reality exhibitions called VR All Art. And we experimented with VR devices ever since they came to the market, we built a platform for virtual exhibitions. And then, you know, like in the moment that we were, you know, doing the platform, that was the moment that, you know, like it, the crypto boom actually two cycles ago, uh, like the crypto boom started to happen and immediately struck me, you know, because we were thinking about um, all the, all these payments and transactions that will happen in virtual reality, kind of crypto made all the sense. So you enter the virtual reality with your crypto wallet and you can literally buy something for, you know, millions of dollars in, in VR without actually leaving, you know, sending an invoice or whatever. And at that time it was, uh, the promise was that you know smart contracts will will bring this uh, smartness into the payments so that we can divide the the money that is going to the artist give the gallery its part you know the uh, platform its part so that was kind of a no brainer for us to say okay this is the future of payments this is the future of of how people will buy things and especially for us as you know like native vr developers it made all of the sense because in VR, one of the biggest problems is, is you cannot take the headset off and enter the credit card details. That's the problem. So it was for us, you know, tremendously easy to, to imagine the future where you're just in VR and just clicking and approving everything on, on your wallet. So um, that was the beginning. And that was the moment then that we realized that we need to enter the crypto and to start experimenting with with, you know, uh, smart contracts and, and payments. But that was also, you know, the moment that we realized what is on the market is not good enough. And one of the reasons uh, was that we wanted to make uh, virtual tickets for virtual exhibitions. And to have virtual tickets for virtual exhibitions, if you want to go and buy a virtual ticket, you don't want to pay transaction fees bigger than the price of the ticket. And you don't want to well, wait. Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you don't want to wait for, uh, you know, like, I don't know, 15 minutes or five minutes to get the ticket. So you need instant payments and basically instant and, and very, very cheap transaction fees. So um, that made it all like, hey, whoa, we have to, you know, like Ethereum is cool. We like it, but we need to find, you know, a tech that will work for our use case. So we started exploring and, you know, like years go by, 2018, 2019, um, we did a fork of Stellar blockchain. And that fork was actually meant to solve, at that time, Stellar was the fastest and cheapest blockchain. And um, we wanted to solve um, a problem. We, we had a project with the music festival and all... On the music festival, the idea, the main idea was that, of course, we sell uh, tickets, but the core concept was that they wanted to have a virtual currency inside of the festival so they can pay everything with a virtual currency. So that was the first use case. The second use case was ticketing. And the cool idea from the guys that, that came to us and said, like, let's build this, was that they wanted to say, the festival, by the way, is free to enter. But the, the main concept is, hey, I want to um, get the free ticket as an, a token in my wallet and then to enter with the free ticket to the festival. So everything is free. App is free. Everything is free. But what was crazy and interesting is that that was the reason for people to download the app. So they wanted people to engage with the new app by, you know, like must download or need to download, uh, in order to actually go and, and, and enter the festival. So that was the first moment that, that we kind of started thinking of, of what are we going to use. And because of the virtual payments that we wanted to embed inside of the festival, next two tickets. Now we are talking about 2019 here. Uh, we needed to create an app. And then a blockchain. And then there was a next problem. And the problem was, but wait a minute, if we're going to use Stellar blockchain or Ethereum blockchain or any blockchain, we need to have a native currency 
that will be distributed to these people so they can actually get their free tickets and then, you know, like use that. And we were like, no, wait a minute. We have to do a fork of, you know, something so that we can have no transaction fees and that we can actually enable the whole system. So we did the fork of Stellar. And, you know, long story short, that, that was a really fun experience because the app was working, the tokenization was working, payments were working, but only 100 transactions per second. Now, can you imagine what was happening on the doors of the festival? I bet they're hitting so many bottlenecks. How how big was the festival? How many people were there? Um, I think um, 100,000 in a day. Oh, goodness. Yeah, you're going to hit 100 TPS and that's going to max out bottleneck real quick. The, the thing is that if you said to people, like, download the app a couple of days before the festival, get your tickets, everything will be okay. But no, of course, everybody downloads the ticket, you know, the, the, the app and get the tickets on the day of the festival, an hour before the festival. So it was a mess. Uh, it all worked. Um, but it was like shaky, you know, like we were looking at transactions, people were opening the accounts like this, you know, like it was super, super crazy. And then we went on the doors and then promoter girls that, that were there, you know, controlling the, the tickets, giving presents, whatever. Yeah, yeah. By the way, we, we decided not to do tickets for the whole festival. We decided to do tickets only for the VIP section, which hosted thousands of people. But still, it was not like a hundred thousand, which was kind of okay. But at the doors, you know, like we were there, and then in one moment there was a line of like twenty people that could not get in. The system was not working. They were yelling at us like, "Yeah, everything is not working." And we were like, "Do you have the internet connection?" They were like, "Of course we have the internet connection." So like, "Can you check it?" And the the girl said, "How do I check that?" <laughs> and I was like, "Go to Google," you know. And then she said like. Well, Google is not working. You don't have the internet connection. And the internet connection was actually, you know, a mobile operator running on a SIM card on some, you know, remote, I don't know, router, whatever. So it was, I mean, I've been in, in business, you know, for, you know, 15, 20 years. And, and in the last 12 years, we've been doing field work, a lot of field work. And the field work is the moment that you actually understand whether something is working or not. Like for your, you know, target audience. Yeah, it's test, testing it with real users when you're doing field work. Yes. So if you want to sell something, go and sell it on the live event. You know, go and, and, and be there when, when things start to break. You know, whether technology is working, whether the internet is working. These are real life situations that we actually like and love, uh, uh, but are very stressful. Um, at the end of the day. So anyway, long sure. story short, I, that's why I said like we don't have enough time. I can tell you these war stories, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, for, for many hours. Um, um, so anyway, in 2019, then uh, we started exploring. After that, we said like this was all fine. It, it you know, it didn't break, but this is not the re the tech that we actually need. And then um, since the you know the not this new bull cycle, but the last bull cycle, when, when it started, we were like, look, um, you know, the hype is there again, uh, demand is there, uh, we should definitely, you know, do something and, and bring crypto to, to art and, and to everything that, that we've been building. So we started to look for, for new uh, tech solutions. And then uh, our co-founder, Yovan came and said, like, have you seen Solana? And I said, actually, I, I have seen Solana. Why? Because now look at, this is a crazy story. So we, we, we started with Ethereum and then we saw Kik, if you remember. Kik, Kik and Kin cryptocurrencies, you know, like Messenger, yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah, I remember them a little bit. They did the fork of Stellar. Based on their fork of Stellar, we said, let's do a fork of Stellar. Then Kik moved to Solana and I was following that move. And I was like, well, if they move to Solana, then there must be something in Solana. And that's how we, we got into, you know, like exploring uh, Solana ecosystem. And that was so early. That was, you know, uh, beginning of 2021. So nothing was there on Solana. Like maybe uh, by, by the time we started exploring, there was only one hackathon that was ever held. And we decided to enter the second hackathon. And I said to the guys in the company, like, stop doing everything that you're doing now and let's, let's do the, 
the hackathon, and because there was no NFT standard, no NFT ecosystem, nothing was there on Solana, uh, we said like, okay, let's let's build a proper NFT standard. Let's let's create something that is different than than um, you know what exists on other chains, and that that is how we started all our protocol. And this is how we actually build an um, NFT Pro standard that now is transforming into into something else. And we can talk about that, but yeah. <laughs> um, then, you know, like all, all the craziness happened. We won in the NFT track uh, on Solana Hackathon. And then, you know, investment investors uh, uh, became interested. Um, you know, everybody was, was uh, talking about it. Then we announced the first open NFT marketplace on Solana called Soul C. And then it just, you know, everything went ballistic. Uh, we released the, the Soul C. And then in a matter of weeks, there was a lot of competition. There was like five or six marketplaces. Uh, and then, you know, like what, what we call a war of marketplaces started on Solana. Um, and then it, that lasted for a couple of, of months. Uh, in the meantime, like there was like, you know, 10,000 collections or 20,000 collections minted. Um, and it was crazy. Like the meta of, of NFT space were changing every week. Like this week, we are making a game. Next week, you know, Zuckerberg came out with the metaverse, changing the name of, of Facebook into meta. Everybody was talking about the metaverse. Every NFT project wanted to build the metaverse. Everybody's yeah. creating a metaverse. Then it was the buzzword at the creating... time for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I remember there was like four different stages or five. First was uh, NFT collection is making a game. Then there was, we are making a metaverse. Then we are making a brand. Then we are releasing a token or something like that. That was the yeah. Think, those, those were the um, stages of the ro- of everyone's roadmap, and it's like it's tiring. It was tiring to watch it. Uh, yeah, and we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just another brand, <laughs> another brand, another token, another metaverse, another game. And you know, like we were there on the front lines. And actually, what what was our mistake is that I mean that that was the main reason why you know we had such a big big problems in the space at that time is because we created an open NFT marketplace. Everybody could go mint, everybody could sell. What we never thought would happen is that people will mint fake NFTs. A lot of them. Like, you know, on the day that we opened, in 24 hours, they were minting fakes, you know, every minute. And and other people that should check whether, you know, what is the creator address? You know, is it a real NFT? They were not checking. They were just going and buying. And, and then they said, we scammed them. And we were like, but we are just a platform connecting the buyer and the seller. And then, you know, like th- th- that conversation took us months um, that, you know, like verify, what is a verified NFT? You know, like what is a ver- unverified NFT? So these are all the, the problems that the whole space had. And then in the middle of these problems, they were so much under the, 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 the surface that was actually going on. Because you had people that minted collections, you verify them, but then what happens is that they then decide, look, you know, like these don't count. We're going to mint new ones who bought the last ones, sorry. And then, People were asking marketplaces, like, you tricked us. We have the verified NFT, but it's not verified anymore. Because now there is some new NFT. And we were like, but this is not our fault. You know, like, so also war stories. I could tell you, you know, like, for, for literally for hours, we could talk about, you know, these different drops, different collections, you know, D-Gods, you know, all, all the, you know, the ruggers, the, the, the normal ones. It's wild People times back really then, for sure. Wild times. Um, and finally, like the, the NFT sector went, you know, uh, down and, and we could kind of rest a little bit, not rest in a literal sense, but rest in the sense that, um, you know, people were starting to, starting to pay attention to what really matters. And we've been here since the beginning because of what we believe in. And we believe in true value of the technology of the blockchain and the reason that the blockchain exists is to actually change the world for better and not to make, okay, nice. I mean, look, we all speculate, we all trade, you know, like 
we are in the sector for many years. So you cannot be in the sector if you don't trade you know, speculative tokens and meme coins and, you know, whatever. So we like that. But in order to have the real mission fulfilled, and that is to bring real world, real life assets on chain, different things need to happen. And the NFT sector had a big problem with branding. Okay? So when it started, everybody was like talking about NFTs, you know, like the, the biggest galleries that, that we are working with and artists were calling us to mint them NFTs. Brands were calling us to mint the NFTs. So that was a, a, a huge movement. But as soon as there were so many different Bruggers or, you know, like, how do you call them, you know, false play or, or, um, um, not, There's not, a bunch of scammers out there. Yeah, scammers. When there all and, these scammers and, were participating and, and, yeah, but, but I, I being a detriment that, upon the ecosystem. Yeah, but I would say that there, there are scammers, there are ruggers, and there are legitimate projects that really tried and failed. So failure yeah. is okay. You tried, you pushed, you spent your money. You don't have any money, so you need to close the doors. That's okay because you did try, and you, you know. And and when we try, when every project tries and builds something and continues to build, there is no turning back. I mean, at least not for us ever. It's like staying there until the last, you know, drop of blood, until you know the last euro is or dollar is spent, and then asking even you know finding more to try to sustain the vision and the idea. Of course, you need to pivot. Of course, you need to, you know, change your direction. But this is a big, I think, differentiator between, you know, a scammer, rugger, and uh, um, a, a legitimate project that tried but failed. And there was, of course, in, in one moment, there were legitimate projects trying. Then ruggers came that, you know, came, tried a little bit, didn't work, rugged, and then you know, huge amount of scammers. And that brought a bad name for NFTs. So NFTs now have a bad name and a bad reputation. So when you talk to regular folks about NFTs, they're like, yeah, but maybe we don't need to be there. Yeah, well, it's also the media, the media, the larger public media, like, um, media outlets i'll call them they typically also do a horrible job of covering anything blockchain let alone nfts they only cover the bad they never cover the good and it just like becomes this vicious flywheel of media covering bad bad things that happen and never covering any good so the general populace of people just think that it's only scammers it's only negative which is you know anyone who participates in the ecosystem anywhere whether it's blockchain or anything there's always good and bad going on, but it's like the media does a, a, a pretty awful job of covering anything positive in the blockchain space. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's definitely <laughs> the spotlight is more on, on the negative side than on the positive side, usually. And and even during the bull run, they're talking about, you know, like they, they, they just give too much space to, to scammers compared to successful use cases and people that really, 100%. you know, build something for real. So on the topic of that, that was the history. I hope that it didn't take too long. Uh, but but <laughs> no, what I can say is that that in the last two years since the bull run, we be we've been developing most of our tech behind the curtains because it was just first of all it, these are big um, movements that we are preparing for for the next couple of months, and it just took a while. It's not, you know, like, and yeah. also like, um, the, the temperature or general sentiment when, when we are in the bull run, people expect big things to happen in a day. Like, hey, build something in a day. Yeah. Expectations you know, like are generally unreasonable. Yes. Like, why there are no updates for the last week, you know, like, or two weeks? Hey, what have you been doing? Like, you know, you, you're, you're fooling around. And like, no, it just takes a lot of time. It's not a small um, effort to, you know, have a, a big development team, a big testing team, a big pro product team. Even if it's a small team, it's still they need to co coordinate. 
You need to build things. These things have bugs. Testers need to test bugs. Bugs need to go back to the production, to, to development. And then, you know, uh, a production can, can launch something. So, and then you need to feel the market. Maybe you made a mistake. So maybe you need to, you know, re-strategize. So anyway, it's, it's a lot of work. And I don't think that in a bull market, anybody's, you know, really happy with a lot of work. People just want to have, you know, the, their prices skyrocket and, and their tokens go to moon, um, which is fine, which is fine. We are in the same boat, so it's okay. We like green candles. So I, I want to I circle back to something you said earlier, like the general idea that so much negativity goes around and gets publicly talked about. And when you're doing these types of larger initiatives, like uh, All Art and, and the rest of your team, you guys recently announced this, this big partnership with Coca-Cola of all companies. Very big company all around the world, global company. How did that, A, can you talk about what that actual relationship is? Like, what are you all doing with Coca-Cola? What of that is like on chain? And how did that relationship and those conversations go when there's so much... Uh, negativity that gets published and, and like talked about in the larger um, when you get when you typically get to larger companies like they they see the bad news they see the bad press how did those conversations go with under with like knowing that you know they probably saw a lot of negativity and and what convinced Coca Cola to do anything blockchain <laughs> well we that was actually our second project with Coca Cola. Uh, the one that, that, that was announced. The first one was actually an NFT drop. So we did an NFT drop for a festival here, um, for, you know, like Coca Cola and they had some, some merch and then the merch was connected with the NFTs and we did, you know, a drop with them on, on, on these NFTs. But here that, that this was more serious and you let's, let's split the two projects into two different, let's say boxes. So the first box is marketing department. Okay. So this is a marketing department working with, you know, marketing agencies basically, and then working with, together with us to propose the project. So we propose actually a much bigger project than just an NFT drop. We propose the metaverse together with the NFTs, all interconnected with tickets that, you know, it was, you know, a, a really cool thing. What was interesting is that Actually, they liked it all together. So their marketing department said, this is all good. But what was the, um, the reason why they decided just to do the job and not do the, the full scope of the project was the time frame. So time frame with these brands is pretty, these big brands is pretty difficult to manage because they have a lot of different departments that are working Every time you want to do something, especially if it's in, in the public eye. So legal, compliance, marketing, sales, everything needs to be aligned on the same project. And because the proposition was just two months prior to the festival, even though we could have managed, agency could have managed, and, and the marketing team in Coca-Cola could manage, um, financials and legal were the problem. So there was not enough time to get all the legal approvals from their, you know, from, from the bottom to the top to get the approval of the project before they can sign it off and before we can actually start the work. Even though we said we can start the work without the approval if, you know, you guys say it's okay. And then, you know, let's, we will wrap up the contracts eventually. But they said, no, we cannot do anything until we actually go to all of these procedures and approve the project. So this is one box. Regular marketing, you know, projects using NFTs. Most of the brands and most of big companies that you saw in the spotlight in the last two or three years that were messing or trying the NFTs were actually doing this. So there is a marketing department in some brand. Marketing department is working with the agency. Agency proposes, hey, let's do some wow, new, interesting, you know, innovative tech. This is what they, they like to call it on these briefs. Like, hey, can you propose something wow? You know, can you propose something that is really innovative, like in the trend right now? And then agencies come and say, 
we can mint NFTs. And Brent said, like, what? <laughs> and then <laughs> you need to explain to them. Blah, blah, blah. So most of these big brands, including Coca-Cola, but, you know, like, I mean, you can, you can name, like, everybody knows, like, from Porsche to, I don't know, who was, you know, the big ones, the Balenciaga did something, I think. Also, like many yeah, a bunch of brands. really big popular brands started doing yeah. assorted NFT things for various yeah. reasons. They started experimenting. Results, Starbucks yeah. did it. Starbucks is now closing the NFTs. But anyway, like all of these brands, they were actually experimenting with their marketing departments. So the marketing has a budget to play around with. So it doesn't go into the core of the company. So just on the surface, what is done in the public eyes? Ah, this project is doing well. Let's do it again. Or no, this project is not doing well. Let's wrap it up. You know, we did it. We tried. Thank you. Goodbye. It doesn't stick. It doesn't stay within the company. Okay. So this is marketing box. The other box is if you can get inside of the core infrastructure of a big company. And our project with digital certificates is actually doing a digital certification for their own employees using blockchain. So we are issuing digital certificates for their own training academies that are done within the Coca-Cola system. And these people receive these digital certificates as first digital objects, as we call them, and then they can mint them as NFTs on chain. And this initiative did not came from the marketing department because marketing, you know, they don't care about a digital academy inside of their Coca-Cola system. It came different concerns their, for sure. Yes. It came from their innovation team. So this is another, you know, it's, it's completely different lines within the company. So innovation team is responsible for bringing innovation within the system and not outside of the system. So their innovation team came to us and, and they said like, hey, you know, like we want to do um, uh, something with our certification. And we said like, we have the right solution for you. Because at that time, we were actually making our platform for new type of metadata. And we can maybe talk about it a bit later. Uh, that uh, includes, mm -hmm. includes certification, um, metadata for certificates. And we said, look, we're going to mint the NFT for um, uh, metadata for certificates in the proper format, and you will have a platform to do that. And then we can actually mint a token that will connect to what we call a digital object, which is the actual document of a certificate in the metadata file. And they said, cool. And then, you know, like all, all the preparations for the project started. Um, but th this is also interesting. This is what, what I was mentioning on, on the marketing side. Like people usually, I mean, people that are not in, in the industry, they think that it doesn't take a lot of effort if the brand says yes. It actually, the, the process of negotiations with the approvals and with contract signing of a big brand is tremendously lengthy. So, what we did, and we released the information publicly, you know, um, I think it was like two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. So I don't know when, when the, the podcast will, will be actually on air, uh, but that, that was happening in March. So we, um, we released the public information at end of February, beginning of March. The, the project actually um, was launched in January, and the project was in the development since fall last year. So it took a lot of time until we first negotiated, then we sketched out the, the project phases, then we started implementation phase after phase after phase, then testing, then pre-launch, and then launch. So it takes, it's not like a hey, one announcement probably that was built in a week. No, we, we built it, you know, throughout, let's say, six months. Good tech takes time. <laughs> yes, it takes time. But what is cool is that this is actually only a phase one. So the phase one, what, how they saw it, and, and we were there to facilitate this transformation within the company, is that it's not only about certificates. It's, so, it's also about rewards. It's also about um, attendance uh, certificates, which are all now minted as tokens. 
or will be minted as tokens. So we are talking about tokenization as it is, entering the pores of their internal ecosystem, where attendance is recorded with tokens, where rewards are given as tokens, where certification is given as tokens. What do you mean by attendance? Like, so, because from my understanding is like the platform that you built for Coca-Cola slash like your white labeled solution, it's a certification platform, like courses and educational content. Do you mean attendance for attending an educational workshop or some other type of attendance? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That type of attendance as this is all piloting. It's not like a, you know, like we're going to, you know, blockchain the whole Coca-Cola tomorrow. So this is like, we need to Fingers first, crossed. no, <laughs> <laughs> of course we, we first need to, okay. Say, okay, we launched the platform. Great success. Everybody was happy. The guys from Coca-Cola were called to many different conferences, internal conferences to present the work. And then we send them, of course, video files, you know, screenshots, things. Oh, that's pretty cool. Help them out in, in presentations. But what is important is now, as we move into phase two and phase three, now we need to prove the first, the first thing was proved. That, that, that's cool. They're, they're super happy. They will now implement certification in all of their um, academies. And now imagine how many employees Coca-Cola has. And now imagine how many different internal uh, courses or trainings everybody in the system needs to go through. Oh, yeah, I bet it's a lot. Well, definitely a lot of employees. And I would imagine there's certifications. There's also a lot of those. Exactly. So thousands and thousands tens of thousands every year. So, um, and then different sales academies, marketing academies, digital academies, like, mm-hmm. you know, all, all different, of course, parts of the company work in different ways. But to get the, the, the solution running into all of these departments together with all the um, educational institutions or, or let's say training, um, you know, teachers and, and, and external training um, bodies that are doing the training for Coca-Cola it takes time. It takes effort. Let's, you know, open the account for these guys, create a digital wallet, you know, create a, you know, signing authority, sign the creation of, of the, you know, course. Then you issue the certificates here. Then they need to sign this. They need to sign. So anyway, it, it takes time. But I believe that the effort is, is worthwhile, first of all. And second of all, we can finally show and say, Look, you know, someone did it. They're using blockchain for something else than cryptocurrencies. And the use case for such a big brand makes a lot of sense. You know, like, hey, you can lean on to this use case and, you know, bring others in. You know, let's, let's bring everybody in. Let's bring universities in. Let's bring, you know, let's start using the blockchain for something else that is not only cryptocurrency, but, you know, a deeper meaning to tokenization. Because this is, at the end of the day, tokenization. Yeah, that's really, really cool, especially, like, naturally with with a big brand name like Coca-Cola, you know, global, national, multinational brand. Everybody around the world knows who Coca-Cola is, so it's, it's wildly fascinating to me. I'm especially curious about, like, the actual conversation. So, one of these ideas that I have generally about the blockchain space is that a, we need good user experience in order to convince people to use the technology with bad user experience. There's too many friction points for people to adopt the technology. And on the flip side, kind of, or not, maybe not flip side, but like taking that even further is like without a good user experience and without having these right, these correct narratives for large companies like Coca-Cola to use the blockchain technology, whatever blockchain that ends, they end up using, thankfully in this case it is Solana, um, whatever blockchain they end up using, how do those conversations go? And how do you like, like I'm curious, like what what sort of things would you say to other people that are trying to pursue these types of larger companies or even smaller companies, medium-sized companies, how do you have those conversations with people that are not blockchain native and you're trying to convince them on a technology that is largely misunderstood and has so much potential? Like what do those actual conversations look like? And, and what would you say like as the, the pro tips as someone who's done it and started having those conversations, what can, what can people learn from it? So that way, hopefully they can do it themselves. 
What I can say definitely is that you need to understand whether the client or, you know, a partner or, you know, an institution or an individual has a problem. And what is their problem? Like, if you're trying to push an idea to someone that has no problems or, you know, problems are, you're not talking about their problems. You're talking about technology, how cool it is. You know, don't talk about how cool technology is. Like, what is the problem that you are solving? So, if we go back to NFTs. Yes, absolutely. What problem exactly did NFTs solve? Well, when, when you when you draw a line, the problem that was solved was actually fundraising. That was the problem that was, you know, an NFT was solution for. Because it was super easy, almost like ICOs. So NFTs were ICOs of 2021. So it was like, hey, I can raise a lot of money quickly with selling the NFTs. But, you know, what did the NFT actually do for the holder? Eh, well, nothing much, you know. And whether the value of the NFT corresponds to the value that was, you know, minted or, or, or sent uh, during the mint? Eh, not really. So, you know, you had tens of thousands of projects raising funds through minting of NFTs with the promise of you can do something with your NFT, but we don't know yet exactly what. Maybe it will be an access. Maybe it will not be an access. Maybe it will be a character in a game. Uh, maybe it's not a character in a game. And, you know, it was, it was a confusion. But the real confusion is what is the problem? You know, like, is there anything specific that the NFT will, will kind of upgrade to a current model that, that will solve the problem of a current model? And now let's go to the discussion about real world assets and the general, I could say, I mean, we, we talked about it, you and I, before when we were explaining this switch of narratives and this new, well, I can say hopefully wave of adoption of blockchain. So first we need to, um, I, I mean, this is my personal opinion and, and, I managed to persuade people in, in the company and the collective to actually uh, believe what I'm saying is that the NFTs are things of the past. Okay? So let's all forget about NFTs. Why? First, because, because there is a, a bad public image of NFTs. When you talk to people about NFTs, they're like, ah, you know, like th this is not really a thing. And second of all, because they do not represent an object that is behind the token. So we don't know what NFT actually represents. There is a metadata file that usually only has, you know, an image, a title, and a description, and some traits. But these traits are never standardized in any industry, in any, you know, niche. Everybody's, you know, creating them as they wish. And there is no link from the metadata back to the token, so you don't know that the actual file of the metadata is um, really created by the token, by the token creator. So there's a lot of technical glitches, but I would say that the main problem is logical, not technical. And the logic goes that if you want to buy an NFT, I ask you, what are you actually buying? Are you buying a collectible? Or are you buying a ticket? Or are you buying a piece of art? Or are you buying a real estate? Or, you know, a boat that is represented as a token. So if we want to move the whole space forward, and this is what we are fighting for and what we are hopefully are doing, is first of all, understand what is the, you know, the concept behind digitalization of assets. And as we defined a new term, and we call this new term DOT, which is D-O-T, <clears throat> Digital Object Token. Digital Object and Digital Object Token. So the difference between DOT and NFT is, first of all, 
there is a digital object behind it. So we talk about digital object, there is a digital object behind it, and you know that the token is actually connected to the object itself. And the object is a metadata document. It's a, it's a registration of an asset. So now we can talk about also real-world assets coming on chain, because there is a document you know, that people understand and can read that there is a document behind the token. This is what we call a digital object. And the most important thing, as we see it, is context. So what is the context of an object? So is it a real estate? Is it an art piece? Is it a collectible? Is it a PFP? Or is it a combination of these? What it is? You know, like, what is it? And, and who defines it is the creator or, you know, someone who has the right to register an object on chain. But behind an object is a document. <laughs> I mean, we, we in the real world, everything that we touch is a document of some form. Whether it's a license, you know, is it a driver's license, is it an ID card, is it a passport, is it, a, you know, a certificate of this or a contract, whatever it is, when we have interaction, there is always a document behind it, documenting the interaction. So I was born, I died, I gave me, there are two documents behind that, you know? And if we understand that if we want to bring the real world into the digital world, we need to have a place where we're going to register our object. And when we register an object, we can issue a token. And this is a token that can be fungible, non-fungible, whatever, you know? You want, but the token represents the object. This is the first part. So there is a document, there is a token. Digital object, token. Now, if we want to talk about the token, we can talk about the problems that are associated with moving the token. So if you want to move the token from wallet to wallet, well, in real world, there are some rules. If I want to change the ownership of my house, or if I want to change the ownership of my, you know, car, or if I want to change the ownership of, you know, like this cup, different rules apply. Different taxes apply. And we can never, ever move 99.99% of the real world dealings and, you know, uh, movements of assets if we don't follow these rules. Because system will object. You know, courts will object, you know, lawmakers will object, regulation will object, everybody will object. And this is what we had in the blockchain space in the last, you know, seven, eight years, because we were not working together with brands, with regulators, with, you know, governments. We were always like, hey, we are rebellious. Look, you can move the tokens around in the, in the wallet in non-custodial way. And, you know, like, hey, I have my money and I'm in the custody of, of my own, you know, keys. And then you lose the keys. And then you're fucked. And then, you know, you want to explain to your mother that she's like maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 years old. And she needs to, you know, remember the keys. And these keys are then the keys to the wallet. And they unlock the prior keys. The prior keys are signed into sections. And actually, the tokens are not in the wallet. They're actually on the blockchain. Then you say, come on. I mean, no one will understand it. They can even, I mean, they, they can barely manage to have the email and password for the website. And they forget. True. So they need to have a forget password button. I mean, you know, and this is the reality of the world. So if, if you want to say, no, you know, like the reality is not cool. I'm, you know, looking, you know, only on my, but look, we would rather have, you know, hundreds of millions of users using the tech than only, you know, a handful of them coming to gamble on, on the tokens. I mean, this is not, like gambling is fine and you know like big casino of, of, of tokenization is fine. But if we really want to move industries into the blockchain space, we need to solve these problems. These problems are how do you manage wallets? How do you register objects on the chain? How do you tell someone that he can buy a golden bar as a real world asset and there is a document, the documents, and there is a certificate that certifies and there is a verification body that verifies the, certifi the certificate and the object. This is what we need in order to 
you know, have super interesting the, idea. There, I mean, the, the 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 core thing is that these um, institutions, companies, they need to have their aha moment. Well, there is a specific, oh, interesting, you know, ah, there is a you know a, a registration. Ah, Interesting. Ah, digitally signed. Wow, where can I check that? Look, click here, click here. You can see the digital signature. Well, Coca-Cola signed it. Wow, I can verify that. Yes, this is a you know a certificate signed by Coca-Cola institution. And you can see that. And then they have their aha moments. And they go like, well, can I do this with my boats? Or can I do this with my golden bars or my watches or my diamonds or you know my wines? Yes, you can. Yes, you finally can. So, because no. So, what you're saying is you're you're proposing this new. Basically, you're taking the idea of a metadata standard, which, if you think of any typical NFT metadata standard that exists in any blockchain now, you have like a, a JSON file that has some some generic information, like the title, description, and maybe an image file or like a pointer to an image file. You're you're talking about taking this idea of this metadata file, but making it a making it more standard like making a more broad more specific standard that can be more composable to the point where there can be verification bodies say like a government or a company that has like officially given their stamp of approval of like i am the certifying body for this like take your your coca-cola example coca-cola is issuing these yes we call that class an evaluator so there is a document, okay, okay. and there is evaluation of the document, and then evaluations have their subclasses, and then one of the classes is verification, the other one is KYC, KYB, AML, things that can be added to the document by a third party, updating the document so that you can have you know um, someone else saying like, okay, this is a valid document. So these these evaluators are effectively giving their stamp of approval of like, Coca-Cola as the evaluating the evaluation body, they say these certificates are are the real certificates issued by us. That stamp of approval gets stored on chain somehow in this this document yes. model. And this document this the specific document links directly to a certificate in this case of an employee. They've been yes. gotten their official stamp, their official certification from Coca-Cola. You can verify it was issued by this company. You can verify that it was issued to a specific person because you can do things like KYC and KYB inside of these this new document standard. Is that is that's like the high level gist of it? Yes, that the high level. Okay. Without going into the details, because I don't know when the, when this podcast will be. <laughs> um, you know, on, on be, air. Uh, so I don't know whether, you know, our announcement will be before or after, but, you know, just maybe people can try to read just teasing the it lines. out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we're teasing it out, but there will be a big announcement of what we've been building for the last two years. And it's a huge thing. Yeah. And it should solve, it will hopefully solve the whole, uh, you know, metadata um, modeling and handling of the metadata documents. This is what, what we are very proud of and what, what we've been focused on. But the cool thing about it is that the metadata then points back to the token. So you know that the token that was on chain issued yeah. and, and you know went to a wallet is actually linked back and forth to the token that was that, that is on chain. And this is also missing in the current metadata documents. But this is what I'm saying. Like, everything in this world, the things that we want to digitize, the things that we are handling, you know, everything is a document of some sort. And when you talk about documents, it's actually a metadata. It's it's some fields and some values in these fields, like you know, date, name, you know, location, whatever. Like a lot of different fields for different data contexts. So every context, like real estate has a description of its own, both a description of its own, diamond, wine, art, like they, these are what we call yeah. There's, there's nuances data to the metadata schemas. for every type of thing. Exactly, yeah. and when yeah. you have a wallet, it's super interesting. And when you have a token in a wallet, I need to understand what it is as a wallet, because I want to give you an interface for you know like a, a folder for your real estate tokens, 
for your art tokens, for your collectible tokens. I cannot mix, you know, a real estate, a crypto punk, you know, a DJ Ape Academy, and I don't know, an art piece of real artist. I want to have my collection of art in one folder, you know, my diamonds in another folder, my precious wines and whiskeys in another folder. And all of them can be tokenized and I can bet on it. Like everything will be tokenized. Everything in the world. Because it's super <laughs> easy to handle. Yeah, this has been this has been so very interesting. Like the whole idea of this uh these relationships that you've built with Coca-Cola, these big brands, and this this very interesting idea of these documented objects and what that's gonna play out how that's going to play out in the future and what that could look like. And especially in the context of real world assets and, and bringing those on chain, like the, the real world assets are definitely the talk of the town in the blockchain world right now. So it's going to be super interesting to see. And uh, the last thing I'll say is um, as we close out here, are there any last minute things that you want to try to quickly mention before we fully close out of the episode? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I could say that that um, I'm perma bullish. I'm really, really bullish on on the technology, on people, on communities. Um, there is a lot of um, maybe we we haven't touched the topic about AI and about how AI is going to transform our digital presence and you know um, bringing philosophical questions on the table. But the fact is. Oh, yeah. That in the future, very near future, like we're talking about, you know, months, not even years, we will have so much digital junk surrounding us everywhere we go, like our own junk, but also junk, you know, everybody else. And and because of the AI, the production of junk will be super quick, super easy. And, you know, like all the social media channels, exactly. And it will only grow. Like people will start, you know, um, outsourcing everything they do digitally to AIs. And then you will end up in the space where everything digital is basically polluted and, and, you know, probably un- untruthful or how do you say this? Not, not, not real. Um, uh, and I believe that we are going into the future where human to human interaction will be most valuable and where blockchain can finally help us in the way that we have the verification and certification proven on the blockchain that can stand behind the digitally produced content or digitally registered assets. So I believe this is the only way forward. Um, And I'm really bullish about this future because we finally need a way to, you know, uh, put the blockchain to the real use, especially in the days of AI. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the the whole AI conversation, AI and blockchain, the cross section of the two is is definitely an interesting one. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely have to get you back on on to do an episode, Vito, and especially we'll when the technology it, but... that yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. hopefully, what we are doing is solving these problems in the AI space, in the real world asset space, in the tokenization space, and you know, once it's out, we can start bringing people in. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Well. On that note, it, again, it's been so great. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, to talk today and, and we'll definitely get scheduled for another episode here soon. And to all the listeners, thanks for listening and watching and we'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.